Well, uh, like I said, we're starting chapter 10 on the Westminster Confession of Faith, and this is uh, the chapter on the effectual calling. Um, and so this is uh, uh, an interesting one. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to see what uh, we're going to see that God does not just have or, or give to us the ability to come to Christ. You know, that's this is what we're talking about here, uh, but that He actually draws us to uh, to Him. That He draws us to uh, Christ. So this is the the. You know, we, we talked about free will and we talked about um, uh, our responsibility. We, we're still recognizing that man does not have the natural ability to come to God. And so if, if we don't actually have a freed will, how then do, do we come to Christ? And so this chapter is going to answer that question. And, um, and so sort of the, one of the, the key verses to, to highlight the effectual calling is actually from John chapter 6, verse 44. There in, in that verse, verse 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so here, of course, we see Christ's role as mediator. When we talked about uh, Christ as mediator a few chapters ago, he says that I will raise him up on the last day. So there we see the work of Christ um, saving, resurrecting, bringing to new life the, the person who is, who is in him, the, the elect, the saved individual. But here we also see the essence of the effectual calling where Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So unless the Father draws that person to Christ, no one is going to come to Christ. Dr. Sproul, in, in his book, Truths We Confess, uh, he says that, that many evangelicals and even many Catholics interpret this text to say that uh, what this means is, is that they will never come on their own initiative unless an individual is enticed or lured or encouraged or wooed to come to Christ. And, and I've had conversations with people who actually believe this, um, and, and it is very much part of Catholic doctrine. I mean, some conversations with some Catholics, and, and they, they firmly believe that it, the Spirit woos people to, to Christ. Um, unfortunately, those who, who have this, who hold this view, they're, they're so in love with human autonomy, human will, human agency, that, that they say God will never invade your soul or shape your will. That's, that's what they say. But the Greek word that's translated as draw here in Jesus' uh, teaching, this same word is used in Acts chapter 16, verse 19. Here, when the men of Philippi saw that, uh, that their hope, so, that, so uh, in, this, in this story, Paul and Silas had exercised a demon that was in a girl who was being, she had the, the ability to prophesy, to predict the future. And so she was making money for, for her master. She was a slave girl. And so when he exercised the demon, these, these men of Philippi saw that their hope of profit was gone. They seized Paul and Silas, and they dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. They dragged them. That's the same word that Jesus uses when he says, unless the Father draws him to me, unless the Father draws a person to me. Those men, Paul and Silas, they weren't enticed they weren't wooed. They weren't invited into the marketplace. They were dragged into the marketplace. They were forced into uh, before the authorities. And so Dr. Sproul mentions that this is the same word that's also used for drawing out water from a well. We don't stand, I mean, we don't have wells, but, you know, back in the ancient day, you didn't stand above your well and say, hey, water, can you come up, please? I'm, I, come here, come here, I need some water. Oh, oh, I'm inviting you. Let me, let me entice you with some crackers or something. No, the, the water at the bottom of the well lies inert. It's absolutely useless unless and until a bucket is lowered into it and you draw it to you. So to understand what the effectual call is, we must understand that man cannot and will not come to Christ unless he is compelled by the Father, unless the Father draws him to Christ, unless we are dragged and converted to Christ. 
And those who are in Christ, the redeemed, the regenerated, the elect, whatever you want to call them, God didn't drag them kicking and screaming against their wills. And we're going to see how this, this plays out. Because their will has been changed. And that's how they come to Christ. And so this is the subject of this particular chapter on the effectual calling. So we'll read the first article here. All those whom God hath predestined unto life, and those only, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of, this, out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Yet so, as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. So this article I've entitled Irresistible Grace. Uh, that's because the effectual call, the subject of the effectual call, is also known as irresistible grace. And if you remember, that's the I in tulip from the five points of Calvinism. So you see how these are uh, permeated throughout, um, throughout our document here. Just a little bit of background on the, the creation of the five points. I wasn't sure if I made that clear before. Uh, back, in the, um, back in the early 1600s, uh, so before the Westminster Confession was written, but, but long after Calvin, uh, in, in Holland, there was a, a group of folks in, in the Dutch church there called the Remonstrants. And they, I think I pronounced it right, yeah, the Remonstrants. They wanted to, they wanted to return uh, the church, or they wanted to take the church away from its Calvinist uh, leanings, which is the, the church in Holland had become, um, had become a reformed sort of Calvinistic church. They wanted to, to reintroduce these, uh, the, the Catholic uh, theology, Catholic ideology under uh, what, be, what we know as Arminianism. So these were the students of a guy named Jacobus Arminius. Now, he's been dead by the time these folks come, but it's his students who, who, and followers who, who gather together as the remonstrants. And so they protest against Reformed theology. And, and what they argued is that, uh, that grace does bring us salvation. So there, the remonstrants and, and Reformed Christians agreed that, um, that grace brings us salvation. But ultimately, they argued that grace is resistible. And indeed, the Catholic Church still holds this doctrine today, as do many um, Arminian um, uh, churches like some, some Baptist and um, some Methodist. Um, they say that grace is resistible, that a person can refuse God's direct call to salvation. So if God calls a person through the gospel, through whatever means, that person can say no to God, essentially what they say. Now, when we talk about irresistible grace, we do, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a weird word in terms of thinking about it. Because on the one hand, to say that grace is irresistible, it is inadequate. Because in one sense, we are able to resist grace. Indeed, that's our standard operating procedure as sinful people. We are, we are naturally inclined to resist obeying God. So in one sense, we do Resist. So, so again, that word is a little bit inadequate. But on the other hand, as Dr. Sproul points out, grace is irresistible in that God's saving work overcomes whatever resistance we set up against it. And that makes sense because God is all powerful. God is effective. God does not uh, change. What God commands comes into being. And so if God says, if God invites the call, it's going to happen. Because God's words don't fall onto deaf ears. And so this is why we call it effectual call or effectual grace. Because irresistible grace, again, that phrase does fall a little bit short. Now when we think about then this word effectual call, we don't always use the word effectual in our daily parlance. At least I don't. I don't know if you all do. When was the last time you used the word effectual? But we are familiar with its cognates. Things like efficient and things like effective. We know those words. We use those words all the time. 
Now, there is a difference between those two words, and uh, there's a management consultant who Dr. Sproul quotes. His name is Peter Drucker, and, uh, excuse me. and he defines efficient and effective. And he says efficient, maybe I'll write this down because it's, kind of, it's good, it's good stuff. So, all right, so he says efficient is doing things right. So there's an order and you do it right. You get it done. And then he says effective is doing the right thing. That's how this uh, Peter Drucker defines these things. Dr. Sproul says that the, the more efficiently we do the wrong things, the worse off we become. So the more efficient we do the wrong things, because we can be very efficient at murder, but that's still murder. Yeah. <laughs> we, so so you, can, you can be very efficient at doing the wrong things, but you're no better off by being efficient at it. Dr. Sproul says it would actually be much better to do the right thing inefficiently than to do the wrong thing efficiently. So he'd rather do the right thing ineffective or inefficiently, so you'd be inefficient in it as long as you're being effective, as long as you're bringing about the good news, in this case of theology. And so this is actually my problem with, with there's, there's a movement in our denomination to want to change presbyteries um, and, and to change what they do. And, and they want to rework presbyteries so that they're more efficient, so that they're more expedient, that they're more pragmatic. Rather, I believe firmly that the presbytery, if we should be striving to change anything, we should strive to be more effective at our ministry we should strive to be more doctrinal in our theology, and we need to strive to be more dogmatic in our faith rather than being efficient, expedient, or pragmatic. Now, there's only one being in all of the world who is efficiently effective, who is both perfectly. Who's that? Yeah, yeah. And now, God is this only perfect, perfect being who can bring about his will perfectly and fully. And of course, now he uses the Holy Spirit to, to, to bring this about, and that's going to be our conversation today, that the effectual call is one of the works of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two types of calls, and we do need to distinguish uh, between the two uh, when we're talking about someone being called to faith called to new life. And I've mentioned this before. Man, I need to change markers. Get the purple one. All right. So there's first the outward or general call of the gospel. This, of course, is the call that hopefully every preacher around the world is giving every Sunday morning. Every evangelist is giving whenever he's out in his uh, revivals. Every missionary is giving every time uh, they're out in the field. So this is the outward call of the gospel. Um, this is indeed the great commission, which is given to the church by Christ, uh, her head. Um, and so when, we, when we're looking at the effectual call, we, we, we see that Romans 10, 17 remains true, that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so there is a component, this outward call component to, to receiving faith, to receiving the gospel, to being regenerated. There, there, is, a, there is an outward call that is, uh, that is related and sometimes even necessary. But not everyone who hears the outward call, and this we know from our experience, not everyone who hears the outward call responds to the gospel. How many people do you know who have come to church but say, yeah, it's not for me. I don't want to believe that. I'm tired of believing that stuff. So they hear the outward call, but that inward call has not been heard. And so the general call 
often is resisted by people. There are people around the world all the time resisting the outward call. And so Dr. Sproul says that the proclamation of the gospel as an outward call can by itself have no effect. So the outward call is itself not effective. But the call of God, when he works inwardly by the Holy Spirit, that is effective every time. Because God is perfectly efficient, efficient, perfect, efficiently effective. We're not. But God is. And of course, this is because of the nature of who God is. Remember, when he created the universe, what did he do? Did he invite the stars to shine? Did he, did he woo the sun into existence? Uh, did he encourage the land to, to, to come out of the, the sea? No. He said, let there be light. And then there it was. There was no argument. There was no, oh, let me think about it, God. It was just boom. He said it and it happened. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, did he invite his heart to start beating again? Did he woo his, his brain to start firing those neurons again? No. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Oh, give me a second, Jesus. I got to, my body still, you know, I need to think about it. No, he got up and he came out. That is the power of the effectual call of the Holy Spirit. When God speaks, when God decrees, when God declares something, when he commands something to happen, it will come to pass. And so the effectual call of the Spirit enlightens the minds of the elect, as the confession says, to understand the things of God. So there is a supernatural illumination that only the Spirit provides, and it is not possessed by unregenerate people. Now some say when they come to a section like this, and by some, I mean mostly theologians. But some people say that there's a contradiction in Scripture that this article or this section seems to, to lift up. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, Paul says, For even though they, and here he's talking about unrighteous people, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then later he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them, says the apostle, because they, again, natural men are, or excuse me, that these things are spiritually appraised. These things from God are spiritually appraised. Now the key to defining and understanding and perhaps seeing that these are not in contradictory is we need to find the word to know or, or the verb to understand. When Paul says that unrighteous men know God, because he says that in Romans chapter 1, he's not saying that they have an intimate, personal, saving relationship with God. Rather, natural man has a cognitive awareness of God. And of course, he says that throughout uh, Romans chapter 1 there how God has made, uh, made known to every human being the invisible things. And so people have no excuse to say, oh, I've, God's never revealed himself to me. Uh, I, God's never spoken to me. I've, I've never seen God. Yeah, you have. Look out your window. Look out your door. Look into space. Look at your anatomy. Look at everything in this created order, and you're going to see God. So people do not have an excuse to say, I've never heard about God. And so that's what he's talking about there. It's not a saving knowledge of God, that intimate knowledge of God, but rather it's just a, a I guess, a, a cognitive awareness of God. Everyone has it. People can deny it. Atheists might deny it, but it doesn't mean they don't have it, that they aren't aware of God. Now, Paul reiterates in 1 Corinthians that the natural man he not only doesn't know God, so he doesn't know God, that's what he says there, but that we cannot know God intimately and personally unless the Holy Spirit enlightens his understanding. That's what he means by spiritually appraised. 
The natural man cannot come to know God unless the Spirit illuminates his heart, illuminates his mind, and brings him to this intimate, personal understanding of God the Father. And indeed, the, the most, say, related to this theme, the most dire warning in the entire Bible when it comes to the subject of this actually comes near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we love the Sermon on the Mount, don't we? Oh, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, we love that, Jesus. But too often we forget that the sermon ends with this great warning in verse 21 of chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And this, here's the dire warning that Jesus himself says. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not make... Uh, perform miracles in your name? Did we not come to church in your name? Did we not read the Bible in your name? Did we not give money in your name? Did we not save people in your name? Did we not do everything in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That is a dire, dire warning that the church is not hearing. The doctrine of the effectual call reminds us that since salvation is of the Lord, we must, we need to examine ourselves. We must ask ourselves, is it well with my soul? Do I belong to Christ? Do I love Christ? And if we have a love for Christ, a real, true love for Christ, then we can be assured of our salvation. But we must be careful not to deceive ourselves. We must remember to love the biblical Jesus. Not the Jesus of your own devising, not the popular Jesus of culture, but the Jesus of the Bible. If you love him, you can be assured of your salvation. Dr. Sproul says that the only way that we can have affection for the biblical Jesus, the only way that we can be so in love with the Jesus of the Bible is if the Holy Spirit has changed our disposition, has changed the disposition of our hearts. He must give us an affection for Christ, whom we formerly despised. And that change of disposition is important. And that encompasses the totality of human nature. The confession says that the spirit enlightens the mind, that he changes the heart, and that he renews the will. I'm sort of paraphrasing there, but you see those three. Dr. Sproul rightly notes that the mind, heart, and will are changed. The whole person is changed by the sovereign power of Almighty God. God doesn't merely offer to change these things. He doesn't invite us to be changed. He doesn't woo us to be changed. He does what he sets out to do. Why? Because he is the sovereign God. This is why God's sovereignty is of utmost importance in Reformed theology. If you were to boil one thing down, which you should never do, but if you were to boil one thing down in Reformed theology, it would be the sovereignty of God. And probably right next to it would be the authority of Scripture. Again, that's why you can't boil things down, because I'd actually put them on the same plane. God doesn't merely offer these things, but he is the one who sets out and it changes our hearts. And this is the reason why Christians are not dragged kicking and screaming into heaven why people are not dragged against their will because god changes us god changes the whole person mind body, or mind spirit and will god changes everything about us so that we come to christ willingly before the spirit's regeneration we're unwilling we're resistant we're shut off to the gospel 
but is through the spirits illuminating our minds, softening our hearts, renewing our wills. Now we desire God. And so Dr. Sproul concludes that the Holy Spirit creates in us the desire for God. And so the debate between Calvinism and Arminianism, between Augustinianism and Semi-Pelagianism, it comes down to this. Is our conversion a unilateral work of God or do we cooperate and cast the final vote? That is where the debate lies. When we submit to the Westminster Confession, as Presbyterians of this church, you do. You don't have to. But if you're a member of this church, you submit to the Westminster Confession of Faith. That's what you said in your vows for membership. We are declaring that regeneration is the work of God alone. That God makes an effectual call on the elect. That he changes them completely. And now they are the ones who do the believing, who do the professing, and who do the embracing of Christ. Our minds, our hearts, our wills have been changed. And now we run to God when before we were running from God. Him. But no one can run to God until and unless God first changes us. So that's the doctrine of effectual call or resistible grace. Any questions on that before we move on to the next article? I got a little preachy there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. All right. <clears throat> Let me wipe that down. I'm going to need that. All right, Article 2. This effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, who is altogether passive therein, until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit, he is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. So, Following off of the last sort of teaching on irresistible grace, I've titled this section, Unassisted Grace. So the work of God in regeneration that we've just mentioned, that we just talked about there at the last section, has a theological dimension that dates all the way back to the 4th century. Uh, there, the work of regeneration has been and, and is debated as, um, as coming forth or being seen in, in one of two ways. Um, I'm going to write them on here. One is monergistically, and the other is synergistically. Have you heard those words before? You've heard them? Sure, one. Yeah. All right. Which one have you heard? Synergism. Synergism. Um, so these words here, of course, let me just give you a little word lesson. Um, oh, my goodness. I misspelled it. There's an R right here, I promise. There we go. All right. So, of course, this is the Greek root word there, erg, erg. Um, this word just means work in the Greek. So it, it's, it's work. And in science, it's actually a unit, a very specific unit of energy. Um, some sort of, like, a, I think I, when I Googled, it was like... 10 to the 7 power joule, something, something, something. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But that's, 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 so erg is work. And of course, whenever we add ism to the end of something, we, we turn it into a philosophy, into an ideology. Uh, that, that's what it indicates. And so, of course, when we see these words here, we have uh, the suffixes uh, mono and sin. Of course, we know some of this is pretty popular. So like monologue means alone, right? A, a person who's speaking alone or talking alone. Um, a mono, of course, just means one or, or alone. Um, sin is either with or together. So if we were to synchronize our watches, what are we doing? We're, we're, we're making them time up, you know, align together to, to, to work together in time, uh, in step together, so synchronize. 
So these two words, monergism and synergism, Dr. Sproul says are conflicting philosophies about something that has to do with work. And so we're going to talk about what that is. And of course, this work, when we're talking about theology, we're talking about regeneration, the work of regeneration. So the question is, is our regeneration, the work of regeneration, something that God does on his own, or do we cooperate with his grace? And so synergism sees grace as cooperative in regeneration. And so human beings work with grace in order to be justified. And monergism sees grace as operative, meaning it is the sole work of regeneration. And we're going to detail this in the next chapter when we get to justification. So for now, I, I just want to just talk a little bit about sort of what the implications of this before we detail it out. For now, we must remember that a person who is dead in sin and trespasses has no inclination to turn to Christ. Right? A, a, a person who is dead in their sin has no inclination to turn to Christ. Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus. We all know that famous conversation there. Just like no one of us, none of us has had any influence in our natural birth. Raise your hand if you told your parents you were going to be born. <laughs> Raise your hand if you, you, you influenced your parents that you, you were going to be born the year you were born. None of us influences our physical birth. Well, likewise... God does 100% of the work of our spiritual birth, which again is what we're talking about here, our spiritual birth. So monergism, which again is what Reformed theology, what we're positing here in Westminster Confession, is that God does 100% of the work. Now we mention this under effectual calling because not everyone who receives the outward call of the gospel receives the inward call of grace. So we'll detail, like I said, monergism the next, in the next chapter. So the reason why we mention it here, not everyone receives the outward call of the gospel. Everyone who receives, who receives? Everyone who hears, not everyone who hears the gospel receives inward grace. Because, and we know this is true, if everyone who heard physically the gospel who heard the outward call, if everyone who did that received grace inwardly, then everyone would believe, right? If all it took was the outward declaration of the word, then all we need to do is be walking around the streets proclaiming it to everybody. And then everybody would be saved. But we know that that's not the case. Because there are unbelievers, because there are people who refuse the outward call of the gospel, there must be an inward call that cannot be refused because, remember, God's declaration, God's word is effective and efficient. And God never invites us to something that we would be able to refuse, that we would never partake in because then God has wasted his breath on us. And does God waste his breath? Absolutely not. And so there are many, many Christians in this world from evangelicals to Catholics, from conservative to liberals, all over the gamut, who falsely believe that God's grace is resistible and be able to be assisted in. And so this means that God's grace, when they say this, when you, you, know, when you come across a Christian like that, it, it, what, what they're essentially saying, they might not say this, but you know, if you press them, they would have to agree, they would say that grace is effectual, meaning that God's work, God's grace, that our salvation is effectual when we apply a synergistic cooperation. That's when it becomes effectual. That's when it becomes effective. That's when it becomes efficient. It does its work when we do our part. And they may use the language of election. Indeed, I've had conversations with Catholics who say that, they, they, that God sees down the tunnel of time and that he is able to see in advance who will cooperate. And that's how he elects people. But Reformed theology asserts 
That election is not on the basis of what God foresees people deciding, but it is on the basis of his sovereign good pleasure. Whatever his will is, it will come about. God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So Dr. Sproul says that God sovereignly determines to give the grace of effectual calling, the effectual calling, not the outward, but the effectual calling only to the elect. And when that grace is given, it is a monergistic work of God alone. The elect do not participate in their grace. They do not cooperate in their justification. It is a work of God alone. God works monergistically, effectually, unilaterally to change a person's heart and to bring her to faith. But here's the hard part. This is the part that hurts us. God doesn't do this for everyone. People are bothered that God does not save everyone. But we forget. We forget that God owes us nothing. If anything we deserve, it is what? Punishment. Because we in our natural state are at enmity with God. So if God owes us anything, which he doesn't owe us anything, but if he did owe us something, it would not be salvation. He owes us punishment. And so if he chooses to be gracious to some and to give justice, we love justice, don't we? Yep. <laughs> if God were to be gracious to some and give justice to others, there is no unrighteousness in him. And he is glorified in both and so we cannot participate in the sense of aiding our justification. Now, we do participate, and we'll talk about that when we get to works in a couple of chapters. But for now, I want to limit our focus to the effectual call, and we do not assist grace when we're talking about the effectual calling. All right, any questions on that before we move to Article 3? All right. I need to get a, a proper eraser. There we go. All right, <clears throat> Article 3. Elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit, who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth. So also are all other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word. So Dr. Sproul says that usually we think of the effectual call of God as attending the inward call. Excuse me. The effectual call is the inward call attending the outward call. Sorry, I misspoke there. So usually when we think of the effectual call, it's the inward call of the gospel that, is, that sort of comes parallel with the outward call of the gospel. That's usually how we assume and that's how we think of things. God works monergist, excuse me, but this article, got a little carried away, God, this article here talks about those who have never heard the outward call of the gospel. Infants who die before understanding, and those who are in places or in states of mind who are, quote, incapable of being outwardly called. That's the subject. So uh, there are those who cannot, who, who do not hear the outward call. And yet the inward call still seems to work. And so God alone has the sovereign ability to work when, where, and how he pleases. That's part of his divine sovereignty. And so this does include those who have never heard the gospel or are too young to understand it. And so this article begins by affirming that God can save a baby while it is still a baby. Dr. Sproul says that the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily withhold regeneration until a person reaches an age of accountability. Now, how many of you have heard about the age of accountability? 
If you grew up in the Baptist church, probably heard about that. This is a popular doctrine, a popular teaching among many Baptists and evangelicals and charismatics. That's the tradition I grew up in. Uh, that a person must come to a particular age, and when they reach that age, at that point, they are held accountable for, for their sin, for their, for their choices. Uh, and at that point, we must convert them. You, you hear that a lot in that, in that theology. But remember, God can apply the merit of Christ to whomever he pleases. Because it is God's work. It is God's monergistic work. It is not cooperative. And so the Westminster Confession certainly confesses that babies can be saved. Though, it doesn't teach that all infants are necessarily saved. What it's teaching here is that there is an unknown number of elect infants. We don't know that number. They don't know that number. God knows that number. And we can rest assured that they will be saved despite never hearing the gospel. Because that is the power of God's sovereign decree. Reformed tradition also holds that the children of believers are numbered among the elect. The assumption is that they go to heaven because they are innocent. That's usually what we assume, right? When we talk about a, a, a child who is, who's died or we talk about infants, they, they're innocent. But what does David say of his own conception? Psalm 51. I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived. Dr. Sproul says that every baby is conceived in a state of original sin. Every natural born human, no matter what age they are, is alienated from God and is by nature a child of wrath until or unless God effectually calls them. And so our, con our confidence shouldn't be whether or not they're innocent because the reality is no person is innocent. Our confidence is in the mercy of God. And so we can share with David where he says at the death of his infant son, he says, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David knew that his, that his infant baby, his, the, I guess the, the, the child of, uh, of Bathsheba, of that adulterous relationship, he knew within his heart, that he would see that baby again in heaven. Because David didn't go to hell. So we can rest assured. Now this article next affirms that God has the power to save people even if they have never heard the gospel. We know that's true. Because God is sovereign and powerful. But the church must not rest and think that God does this all the time. Because our marching orders remain the same. Our command is very specific and it does not change. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded. God certainly has the ability to elect anyone anywhere. He does, because he's sovereign. But he very often chooses to use the foolish means of preaching, of evangelism, and of missions. Remember what Paul says. God alone gives the growth. That's what we're talking about here. God gives the growth, but Paul planted. And Apollos watered. Yeah, God has the power and the ability to save anyone he wants, but that does not give us a way out, an exemption clause to stop preaching the gospel. Because God very often uses the outward call to spark the inward call. All right, we've got 10 minutes. Maybe we'll wrap up the last article here. Article four. Others not elected, although they may be called by the ministry of the word and may have some common operations of the spirit, 
yet they never truly come unto Christ and therefore cannot be saved. Much less can men, not professing the Christian religion, be saved in any other way whatsoever. Be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature and the law of that religion they profess. And to assert and maintain that they may is very pernicious and to be detested. So this last article is on the exclusiveness of grace. The last line of this article is very strong. It is very pointed and it's very clear. To assert and maintain that they, men not professing the Christian religion, that they may be saved is very pernicious and to be detested. Now most Westerners in the pluralistic world that we live in today consider repugnant any notion of, of an exclusive way to God. They say to do so would be inhumane, to be bigotry, to be intolerant. But the thing is, neither you nor I nor the church nor any individual across church history ever invented the idea that Christ is the only way to God. None of us invented that. Augustine never invented it. Calvin never invented it. Irenaeus never invented it. Paul and John never invented it. Jesus himself makes the claim to exclusivity. John 14, 16. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, that's cool. No one comes to the Father but through me. Dr. Sproul says it should neither be strange nor surprising that the Christian faith, which is rooted in the Old Testament, makes a claim to exclusivity when the very first commandment that God gives his people is, you shall have no other gods before me. I didn't invent that claim. What God found displeasing with his people century after century. Just go through and read the Old Testament. Chapter after chapter, page after page. What is it that God finds displeasing? It's syncretism. Where the people would blend the religion of scripture, the worship of God Almighty, with the religions of their neighbors. With a little bit of Baal. And a little bit of Molag. And a little bit of this, and a little bit of that. That is what God found displeasing. They would have their synagogues, and they would also have their Asherah poles. Over and over again, Israel repudiated the exclusive claim that God had on them. Centuries after centuries, God's anger was tempered until at last, he exiled his own children. We are blessed in this country that our founders refused to establish a state or national religion. The First Amendment is one that we all cherish and we all benefit from. But Dr. Sproul rightly notes, equal toleration under the law does not mean equal validity before the eyes of God. A Buddhist, a Hindu, an atheist, a Wiccan has as much freedom in America to worship as the Christian does. And by all means, they should. Don't take it away from them. But just because America allows it does not mean that their religion is true or valid. Neither Muhammad, nor Buddha, nor Moses, nor Confucius met the qualifications of a sinless person that God established in his covenant. And therefore, none of them could die for their people. And none of them did. Dr. Sproul says that what is missing from other religions but is present in Christianity is an atonement. 
that God would give himself to purchase for himself our salvation from himself is unique only to Christianity. And so this final article affirms that it doesn't matter how devout or how obedient a person is to his or her religion. Salvation cannot be had apart from Christ, who is the center of the Christian religion. The effectual call of salvation proceeds only from Christ and produces only Christians. And so com com uh, concluding remarks before we close. If we are effectually called, then we will love Christ. If we are effectually called, we will love Christ. Christ. If we love Christ, what does he say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if we love Christ, we will obey Christ. We will run to him and submit to him. If we love Christ, we must detest everything that degrades or demeans him. Now, this doesn't mean we detest the people who demean God. After all, the effectual call can be delivered even unto pagans who are late in life. But we must hate the demeaning of Christ when we see it from all levels of society, from the lowest beggar to the highest office. We must hate it when Christ is demeaned. And so the question is, it's not, excuse me, the question is not, why does God give only one monergistic, effectual way to be saved? That's not the question we need to be asking. Why does God give only one way to be saved? to be saved. Rather, the question, the real question is, why has God given any way to be saved? The doctrine of the effectual call always brings us back to grace. That God would be so gracious to even call us for his own. That is a sign of love that he does not have to show us. So that God would provide any way to salvation is a sign of his grace. And because he is gracious to give us one way to him, our right response is to submit to it. Any questions? All right, well, let us, oh, yeah. Uh, it yeah. A lot. Well, and uh, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of answers there. One is they never actually had the effectual call on them, so they were never a Christian in the first place. That would be one response in light of our teaching today. But also, the other response could be just that they they don't fully understand the 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 doc the, you know the system, the doctrinal system that's there. Um, whatever you know. There's a reason why Christ, you know, everything pointed to Christ in the Old Testament. And now we are looking back to Christ because Christ is the center of everything. And perhaps they, they, they don't quite understand that. That would be, I, I haven't met many people. I, I've never met anyone personally who's converted to Judaism. I know people are out there who do that, but I've, I've never met anyone, so I've never asked them. I've, always, I've known people who've converted from Judaism to Christianity, right. but I've, I, I don't know anyone personally who's gone in the other direction. I do. 
Well, I mean, there's the there's evidence of the absence of the effectual call. I mean, I, I hopefully he he'll hear it one day, but you know. Well, and I, I wouldn't say it's brainwashing because it has a negative connotation, but I think it's just it's a lack of understanding the, the doctrinal system. Why, why did Jesus come onto this earth? Why, did, why, was, why would, did God incarnate himself into a man? By and large, if, if a person is, especially if a person is coming from a Christian background to one of these other religions, I would, I'd be willing to bet money if I were a gambling person. I'd be willing to bet money that that person was a cultural Christian meaning they were Christian only in name. They went to church because their parents told them to, or that's what we've always done, or that's what I was raised doing. And they never actually took the time to study the word. They never took the time to, um, to, to dive into the theology and, and the actual understanding of it. Now, some people do that, and, and some people then become disenfranchised because then they realize we're, we're, we're useless and worthless as human beings, and they don't like that. But when you realize the theology and study it, if you really truly dive into it, it becomes very clear that we need Christ. And my guess is people who leave the faith were just never taught that. We're never taught to study the scriptures in, in such a way. That'd be my guess. But I mean, it's a good question. And it still doesn't stop that we need to evangelize and have conversations with them. And of course, when I, you know, when I say the word evangelize, what we think of is the tent meeting with the Bible, you know, the, the <laughs> you must repent. Yeah, okay, that, that works sometimes, but really evangelism is having conversations, those hard conversations with the people that we know and the people that we love and, and just, you know, chatting with them. And, and sure, it might make us uncomfortable, but Paul was dragged into prison for preaching the gospel. The very least we can do is feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just thinking about the perspective, too. Yeah, but that's a very good question. Any other questions? You must repent. <laughs> Throw the Bible at you all. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for giving us Jesus Christ. Indeed, we know that, uh, that this is a great gift. We, we wouldn't be able to know you and have relation uh, with you and, and, and uh, to be called your children if it weren't for Christ. And so, God, I ask that as we live more and more into our faith as his disciples, may we continue to grow in our love for him and our love for our neighbor and, and in the willingness to, to share with them that same love Lord, we're so thankful for the purchase that he made on that cross. And we're so grateful for the call that you have given to us. Lord, I ask that you continue to, to show us ways that we can help people hear your call of the gospel. As we go out and proclaim and bear witness, may we always remember that you, you use the foolishness of our conversations, the foolishness of of our preaching, the, the foolishness of our evangelism to bring people to you. Lord, I ask that you use us in like manner. 
May we depart from this place recognizing that you work alone, but you call us to proclaim and to teach. We pray all this in Jesus' name.